Give a special tribute to, in memory of John, Dr. John Dube, the first president of the African National Congress. Uh, there you see on your screen, uh, Dr. Mlambo Nguka, former deputy president of South Africa and the current executive director of the United Nations Women. Um, party <laughs> one. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, the guest speaker, Dr. Pumzile Mlambonguga, the Vice Chancellor of the University of KwaZulu Natal, Professor Nana Pogu, His Royal Highness Prince Mangosu Tubutelezi, the Mayor of Solplatki, Mr. Patrick Mabilo. Mr. Nwabisa Matoti of the KZN Premier's Office, Professor Tlengiwe Mkize, the Deputy Minister, Mr. Gwazim Shengu, MEC for Education, Umama Batabile Lamini, President of the ANC Women's League, members of the board of the JL Dube Institute, members of the UKZN Council, members of the UKZN Executives, Deans, Professor Sakele Bushlumu, Vice Chancellor of the University of Fourth He, Traditional Leadership in Kosi Utiliza, members of the media, all members of the provincial government and its structures, staff and students of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, other distinguished guests, all protocol observed. My responsibility this morning is to highlight the ongoing collaboration between the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the College of Humanities, and the JL Dube Institute. Indeed, in honor of the legendary statesman Ubaba Mafuzela Dube. Seeing that most of the work of the Institute to date has been on land restitution, providing the research that has guided discussions on this topic, I want to proceed very, very briefly by way of a historical reflection. And in doing so, I want to draw from the often ignored contribution of women to the struggle for political emancipation and indeed the struggle for land rights. It is said that uh, when the British Red Coats, meaning the British Army, finally stormed Ondini on the 4th of July 1874 to burn the capital of the king, who did they find there? They found there Queen Mkabi, wife of Inkosi Senzangakona Kachama. At that time, she was 100 years old. Because the British wanted to destroy the capital and to put under colonial rule what was at the time the only independent state, they asked her to vacate the capital. What did the Queen Mother say? She said, I'm not going to vacate the capital. And on that moment, she committed suicide, mm. the highest act of sacrifice in defense of the land. Thereafter, many were to follow on that example. And I'm not going to mention them one by one. But I do want to highlight that Ingos, indeed, Ubaba Dube, was an Inkosi of the Kadi uh, section of the Nobo family. He is descended from that branch. Inkosi Udube was to follow on that tradition of defending his people. Fortunately, he and many of his contemporaries 
had acquired Western education and they were able to combine Western intellectual tradition with the indigenous tradition in defense of the land, hence the formation of the African National Congress. I do also want to highlight that many of the leaders of the liberation movement, the most prominent perhaps being none other than Inkosi Holitlata Mandela, spoke proudly of this nourishment that he received at the traditional court, which contributed immensely to his formation as a leader. Inkosi Udube himself would go on and engage many issues on the tensions between tradition and modernity, issues that are still with us today as we grapple post-independence South Africa with many issues, including the land issue. But we do want to highlight that in the ancient Kemet tradition, the high laws of the land, stipulate that land has got to be administered in a just manner and we all know that women are the workers of the land and it has been so from time immemorial and any issues of land injustice cannot be contemplated without taking their voice into consideration. I do also want to highlight in particular that the JL Dube Institute has signed a memorandum of understanding with the University of KwaZulu-Natal. One of the many objectives of this cooperation is to conduct research and to train postgraduate students, and we are already undertaking this. For example, recently, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and in particular, the Department of Maritime Studies has facilitated the reabsorption, reabsorption of students funded by the Transport Education and Transport Authority to complete their master's degrees uh, here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, which they could not do uh, completely abroad. The Institute has also played a major role on land research, providing critical papers that inform discussions in this regard. I would like to forewarn you that so, sometime in the second quarter of the year, Professor Itumelang Malume Musala of the Institute will be giving a university and college, college le lecture on the land debate. The college is also partnering with the Institute to undertake contemporary and, past his, and a past histories project in in the southern region of the African continent. This to ensure that the valent contributions of men and women to the liberation of our people are not lost. A leading professor uh, in African history has been commissioned to work on this project. I'm not going to mention his name because I have not obtained formal, uh, a formal uh, <laughs> a letter uh, from his institution to this effect, so I'm going to put him in trouble. <laughs> but this will be undertaken as of the second quarter or semester this year. This is also our attempt to heed the call by the National Institute and Humanities of South Africa to document local and contemporary history as well as history pre-1652. In a nutshell, Ladies and gentlemen, the university and the college and the JL Dube Institute are in partnership and we are looking forward to taking this partnership into the future in order to complete the political, spiritual, economic liberation of our people. In conclusion, I would like to refer to some anecdotal uh, uh, evidence on how on the African continent, people looking at the world with a Africological, epistemological lenses see the work of creation. It is said that the ultimate being wanting to create the world had nowhere to stand. So, in order to create a platform to stand, the ultimate being extended themselves. I'm avoiding the he and she thing. <laughs> 
So the ultimate being extended himself, creating a moon on which to stand. And it was from that platform, a platform of location, that the work of creation was uh, enacted. So, ladies and gentlemen, without land, there is nowhere to stand. There is no way and no ways that we can uh, articulate ourselves as a being. Without land, landlessness equals death. So on that note, I would like to say we welcome the very, very distinguished Umama uh, Utogotela uh, Mlambonguga, who will be giving us her keynote today on this JL Dube tribute. We honor her work immensely, and we are looking forward to her fruitful uh, uh, engagements with us, continuing indeed the legacy of Ubaba Udube Ikati Nyabonga. Mm. Thank you, Professor Mkise. Stalwart of the ANC, activist of note within the ANC, member of the NEC for a very long time, former Minister of Minerals and Energy, former Deputy President of the country of South Africa, the first woman to hold that position to date, the current Executive Director for Women, UN Women in New York, your work and activism speaks for itself. You are home. We humbly welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Nana Pogu, UKZN Vice Chancellor. Professor Ntlantamkize, UKZN Department, Vice Chancellor College of Humanities. I hope this is right. Mm -hmm. Members of the University Council, Mrs. Tandi Ngobo, CEO of Dr. JL Dube Institute, and the Jail Dube board members, Deputy Minister Professor Klingibem Kize, and former Minister of Labor, Minister Oliphant, representatives of the KZN government, representatives of the ANC, representatives of the Dube family, students as well as academic representatives of this university. I am so glad to be home and to be part of a celebration as well as to honor our icon, iconic leader. Dube remains an inspiration, and his life is full of lessons. I do want to salute him for being the first president of the ANC, amongst many other things, for establishing Ilang Alase Natali, and the fact that he was already at that time dedicated to engaging an informed society. And Ilang Alasa Natal has given us a lot of vocabulary. This is Zulu. I remember one day it had a headline about me after I had not been communicating my decisions about what was to happen about the mining charter. And it said, Umlambo Nuga Utule Ute Du. That was just vintage. I also salute him and his wife, Umam Noktela, for giving us Ohlangi Institute, as it was known then, and for their love for education. 
Mam Noctela was a fundraiser, a teacher, a curriculum developer, a songbird whose singing charmed audiences as far as Brooklyn in the USA. She was an unsung hero and a formidable leader in her own right. I have no doubt many of the problems they tackled were daunting, and yet they forged ahead. It could not have been easy to lead a political party, I think we know. It could not have been easy to start a school as a black man. It would not have been easy to establish a newspaper. Just to name a few. And all of this happening in the South Africa of the early 20th century is nothing short, or rather, is heroic by any standards. As we could expect, whatever he did, which was of national interest, was not smooth. He faced criticism opposition, and sometimes disappointed, and he even named, and the name Umafuguzela, rather as a criticism. I have been touched by his life in a very special way, because he led the ANC, which I became part of. I also went to Oshlange High School, and, was, and those were the best years of my life as a scholar. A rich learning environment, notwithstanding that Oshlange was not a leading school in academics. We had pockets of excellence, and we learned how to be ambitious. I'm grateful also for S. Ding Mobo, who was the principal, and he too was one of a kind. Well, he was my uncle. He literally made the life and times of J.L. Dube become alive on campus. In debates, in arts, in sports, in academics, we explored J.L. Dube. When I see musicals today in New York, I cannot help feeling there should be one about Mafuguzela. And the one about Mafuguzela will be so rich and so diverse. Our annual packed Mafuguzela Weeks at Otlange, which was a celebration of his life, was our own make-believe Broadway about him. And it was not too shabby, I must say. And maybe some of you uh, had attended Imafuguzela Week. Uh, maybe you were too young. But it definitely was not too shabby. And then I went to Roma University for my bachelor's degree. And I could not resist to do a research project on Dube which was supervised by Dr. Jeff Guy, who later became a lecturer in this university. And after that, I went to teach at Otlange. I just could not separate myself from this institution. And being a teacher at Otlange High School was one of my best jobs. I enjoyed teaching. It was not easy because it was the 80s and there was a lot of restlessness among students, but it was an enjoyable job. And I then left to join an international organization in 1985 in Geneva. And of course, I did not know much about international relations, but I drew enough confidence from the Othlange can do attitude and the spirit of Dube that was infused in us. I remember 
my youngest brother asking me when I was to leave to Geneva. We say, I wish, I was able to Zola His concern was what he As if that was not enough, uh, he also said, Do you actually even know this job? Because you have not been trained for it. As you know, in many of these international jobs, we are not actually trained for it. And I had to assure him that, Mina, you do well intend. I am a zebra from Otlange. I got this. And we really were so proud as zebras of ourselves. And we even called ourselves Ama Zebra Mahle, even though, even if we were to say so ourselves. <laughs> I wish I could sing at least one song about Dube, but I won't. Because there were some great compositions about him, which we sang with a lot of joy and spirit. The time to prepare for exams at Otlange was somber and intense. And it was also a time that made us truly reflect about our purpose of being in that institution, which included making Dube proud. And it was a school where your academic year was filled with activities. I just used to wonder, Guti, the students used to get into a lot of trouble doing other things. Where did they get the time? Because it was such an engaging environment. Obongalab. <laughs> Long after my time, of course. Uh, we visited Fugu's grave one and again, now and again, and always in awe and in praise. And it was befitting that we always felt Uguti, I Lalaga in the Mayako, we faced We just wanted to assure him that Lalaga Lekawi in the Mayako. We face it. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we are facing different challenges to those he faced. We have seen progress as well as setbacks in our country. And in order to solve the problems, we have to do the heavy lifting like Dube did. We know from experience that if we dedicate ourselves, we can move mountains in this country. Starting with rejecting mediocrity and embracing, and embracing the true public service spirit, but to build, dealing with defining the challenges of our time effectively. These challenges are social, they are economical, and they are political. But just let me start with the one problem that is very close to my heart, the sketch of gender-based violence and argue that this is a battle for men, Tawa. It is not a battle for women. And it is important that men as coming from a perpetrator constituency, just like us women, we fight against gender-based violence because we come from the survivor constituency. They need to play a critical role 
in addressing the issues because women are not significantly and well positioned in, for instance, law enforcement, in cultural roles, they are just the walking wounded. And the men are the bystanders walk, watching the walking wounded battle for themselves. And who are these walking wounded? They are babies in nappies. They are okoko with their pension. They are a young student working in this university. They are a person at home who's a victim of domestic violence. They are a worker. They are a young person, a student in public spaces. So I issue a call and say this is not a battle for women. Vilan Bafit. We have to end the bystander culture. It is not enough to think you are a good man. As Madiba once said, when good men do nothing, that becomes a conspiracy against women. We know that this situation is a crisis and that it is a public health crisis in addition to being gross violation of human rights. Because the WHO tells us about the depth of the problem. And they know from the data that they get from mental health practitioners, the data that they get from dentists, the data that they get from ENT specialists, the data that they get from orthopedic surgeons, the data that they get from emergency rooms, and the data that they get from the morgues. And if it was any other disease, corona, Ebola, all hands would be on deck. So we really have to dig very deep to find the answer. And Minister Sengiwe, I thank you, the team and the president for the emergency plan, which we are dying to see implemented for responding the way we have responded. So now we are in 2020. This is the 25th year of the implementation of the Beijing Declaration, which is the most comprehensive agreement ever adopted on gender equality. It is a consensus of 189 member states of the United Nations on gender equality. When member states come together and adopt a program, and forge a, a consensus, it was because they are agreeing that this is something they want to do together, and they become pressure, peer pressure on each other. Just like the United Nations Declaration is a document that is there to hold them together. The Beijing Declaration was about them agreeing about what needs to be done to support women. There is agreements for many things in the United Nations that member states agree to do and what they agree to regulate. Like every time a plane takes off anywhere in the world, it is because the United Nations regulates the airspace and it is important to adhere to that, otherwise we can cause a crisis. We even have, a, as you know, regulations about wildlife. Which animal to kill, which not to kill, and how to treat animals. In 1995, it was then that they decided 
there's a problem about women. The universal rights do not apply and impact women in the same way as men. So we need to find a consensus what to do about this issue. It was also at that time that women declared that human rights, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Because women, it was just development. But actually, the violation of their rights were much deeper than development. So we have been implementing over 25 years, but we have not been able to go far enough. It's been patchy, it's been slow, it's been unequal. But I also must say that there has been great strides in these 25 years. We now have to address the remaining gaps. We also are commemorating this year the 20 years of the Security Council 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. And in general, the glass is half filled. Since the Beijing Declaration in 1995, we have 131 countries that have changed their laws to advance gender equality, which is indeed progress, but we are far from er eradicating all the bad laws because in each country, there are many discriminating laws that need to be eliminated. Many countries have also enacted laws to advance gender equality and to address violence against women, such as the laws that have criminalized domestic violence, which in 1995 when they met in Beijing was not a crime. And in the last 25 years, girls' attendance at school improved and, re and they reached parity with boys and girls being equally represented, especially in primary education. But of course, we still have problems of retainment, completion, and quality the further we go. And that still needs attention. The enrollment was highest and most improved in countries that started at a very low base, in part because in those countries, girls were missing. They were not going to school in large enough numbers. With the push of Beijing, the number of girls that went to school increased dramatically. And in Beijing, it was the African women who called for the definition of a girl child. They said, we are not just talking about children. Let us profile the girl child. It was because of that analysis that we were able to identify the fact that girl children are denied education. So this issue has to be sorted out in a particular way. It was because of that analysis that was made by the African women that we identified child marriage as one of the violations that only affects the girl because she's a girl. It was because of that analysis that also identified female genital mutilation, which only girls experience, and therefore specific measures were made to address this situation. And it has been good that in the last 25 years we have seen the efforts to address the issues. Again, the glass is half filled. We are not there yet. Many of the countries have passed laws to ban child marriage and FGM. They have provided institutions to address the impact of FGM on women, and they have made 
teachers and communities accountable for when girls are taken to be married off at a young age. And we are seeing in countries like Malawi and Zambia, chiefs standing up and talking for girls. We have girls who are now child marriage survivors who are being taken back to school. And I love it when you give those girls a scholarship and you say, this is, this is your unwedding present, my baby. Go back to school and get a life. Um, we've also seen in the last 25 years access to maternal health improving and maternal death decreased by 38% uh, between the years 2000 and 2017. In Niger, for instance, a country with a very, very high fertility rate, at the age of 20, sometimes a woman already has four children. And even though the economy of that country has been growing, it has not been possible to enjoy the growth because the population outstrips the growth. So it's an unending race in that uh, country. And at the same time, they've also, they also experienced problems of maternal deaths that could have been avoided if we had proper medical facilities and care. We have also seen that culture plays an important role in entrenching child marriage and FGM, and we have mobilized the traditional and cultural leaders so that they can be partners in this journey. Because in fact, in many of the areas that are stubborn in the work that we do, we find that norms, stereotypes are the biggest problem, is the biggest elephant in the room. And in the more developed societies, it is the stereotypes that are also propagated by the media. And of course, all of this also ties men and boys in some cultures as the custodians that have a monopoly over these cultures because that is what patriarchy gives them. And that is why we now mobilize and recruit men and boys. We are just saying, Bajita, you must not be afraid to say I'm a feminist. That's a good thing to be because you stand for women that must be respected. You stand for being tolerance of sexual difference. You also don't support any of the cultural and traditional and harmful practices that are directed to women and girls. So we also still have 190 million women who have unmet needs for family planning. If you consider that the birth control pill was the greatest discovery that ever came to our shores, when women did not have access to birth control and therefore unable to place and plan for their children, their capacity to be engaged in the labor market was very erratic. But in the world today, we still have 190 million women who do not have that right. Over the past 20 years, the gender gap in labor force participation has been at 31 percent, has, has, sorry, the labor, the labor force participation gap has been at 31 percent, 
and 75% of women work in the informal sector as a result, with no pension and no health insurance. So these are some of the challenges as well as the progress that we've seen in the past 25 years. Progress as challenges, we have somewhere to go and we have something to build on. Now let me turn uh, our, our attention to climate change. According to uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, the South Africa Renewable Energy and Independent Power Producer is an effort to create a more diversified and cleaner generation portfolio. We need to address the situation of fossil fuels in the world. South Africa has a potential to be a champion and to leapfrog into the green economy and environmental technology. We already have seven provinces who have concluded green economy strategies, but now we need urgent implementation. Because on one hand, we have to address the shortage of energy supply that we are facing, but also we have to fast track to clean energy. And as a country that has fuel, fossil fuel, this is a perfect storm. Countries use energy sources that they have exposure to. A country such as Norway, for instance, uses hydro because they get the water that melts from the snow that they have so much of. A, a country like us has depended on fossil fuel because we are rich in coal. But we actually now have a problem because fossil fuels contribute towards the negative uh, effects of climate change. We have to use the strategies that are being developed by the provinces to slowly but fast clean our energy. We have to tighten the standards to reach zero emission by 2030. We also have to raise awareness of South Africa's population on energy efficiency and broad environmental and climate change issues. This is the time to improve the whole green ecosystem and to heavy lift the way Dube did. We have also seen countries that have migrated to clean energy, like the United Arab Emirates, a rich country in oil, which, however, has a predominance of clean energy. That takes some doing. And it is this doing that we need in South Africa for our greatest problem. The problems we have have got solutions. And we have the intellectual capacity in this country to use the solutions that are available and to create our own solutions. So I am just saying we are people that can change our own destiny and help to rebuild our economy. We have appreciated the drive for investment that we have seen despite these difficult times, but clearly without the energy crisis solved, it, is, it will continue to be difficult. So we have to solve it so that the drive for investment that we are seeing can truly yield everything we dream of in this country. So 
I have spoken about these two challenges, gender equality and environment. These are the 21st century critical challenges. They are both global, but they both require national resolve in order for them to go away. The gender-based violence also needs national resolve and coordination and cooperation. Yes, the tasks may be daunting, but they are not impossible. Inaction is even more destructive. The lessons and the page we take from Jail Dube is that you have got to get yourself dirty, your hands dirty to solve big problems. So this year, as we remember Beijing 25, which is a global effort to find solutions by the 110 countries that forged this consensus, we have to get ourselves dirty and dream big. In 2020, we have to agree that we want to be ambitious in our planning and the deliberations about these ambitious plans will take place this year under a theme called Generation Equality, which recognizes that right now we have the largest cohort of young people on the planet ever, especially between the ages of 24 and down. They provide the intellectual capacity, potential, and skills that could address these issues we are discussing. And we need to mobilize them. They are young and part of the generation that includes all of us. And together, we can make the great leap forward. We are the first generation that have a real chance to end gender equality because we know the stuff, we've seen the problems, we have tried, we have failed, and we have succeeded in some cases. So we know where to scale, where to accelerate, and what to do. We are also the last generation with the possibility to save the planet. No pressure. First generation to, who can achieve gender equality, last generation who can save the planet. Let us do the heavy lifting. It is in our hands to make this change. So we will be meeting to del deliberate on these issues as we look at how we are advancing the Beijing platform in Mexico and France in May and in Paris this year. And alongside that, especially when we meet in Paris in July, there will be satellite events all over the world, including in South Africa, which will be deliberating on these issues. We have six co uh, uh, action coalition that will take action on the issues that we have decided we need to address in the next five years in such a way that we overlay the Beijing Declaration and the SDGs. And the six issues are economic justice, innovation and technology, ending gender-based violence, sexual health and reproductive uh, uh, rights, leadership and, and, and people's movements, all of which uh, will address the issues of women, but also will, ad will advance the interest of men. 
we have to work together and engage private sector and we intend to also have private sector and academia and young people especially and traditional leaders as we address these issues. Because if we do not make sure that we are inclusive, we will not find the solutions. And of course, we also will engage men and boys and create a platform for them to also take their rightful place in this struggle. And we will not praise them for doing this job because we will not praise fishes for swimming. <laughs> this is a job they have to do. Uh, this is the path that we have to take into the future. This is the path that Dube took at different times in his life. It is about heavy lifting and being decisive and moving forward. And as Franz Fanon said, out of relative obscurity, every generation has a mission to fulfill or betray. What is it going to be with us? Thank you. Thank you so much. The time for slogans is over.